Happy New Year, Swallowfield family. Welcome to church. We are so glad you could join us. I am Judith Murphy, and our speaker today is our very own Pastor David. And the title of his message is The Audacity of Faith. Remember to share the link with your family and friends and subscribe to our YouTube channel. May God bless you as we worship together. Good morning, church. Welcome to church. It's a new year. Celebrate with us as we sing about our God, how he's fighting for us. Here we go.
are possible. And so God, we worship you today. We thank you, God, for your love. Amen. When we receive Yahweh, you keep your promises. If you said it, we believe it. If you said it, if you said it, we believe it. Good morning. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise your name. We glorify you because you're worthy. Lord, we lift your name on high and we just love to sing your praises. As we come into your presence, Lord, we recognize that we would have done things that is not so pleasing to you. So we ask that as we confess our sins, you will be faithful and just unto us to forgive us of our sins. We want to bring to you, Lord, this nation and the numerous of things happening in it. Lord, we want to bring to you our government, their leadership, and we do ask indeed that wisdom will come from above. Lord, we want to give you 
the poor and the needy, those who are suffering. Lord, your word tells us that we shall cast our cares upon you, for you will sustain us. And I thank you that you will sustain those who are suffering in any form or shape, whether through illness, finance, spiritually, emotionally, in any way that you will sustain as we cast our cares, as we come and we tell you what is happening to us, Lord. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, we want to live for those who are a part of the congregation of Swallow and, Lord, are suffering in their flesh. Lord, they are healing in different ways. Father, we want to plea a special plea for them as they are a part of the body of Christ. And we ask that you just unleash your spirit of healing. We thank you, Lord, that by your strife we were healed. And so, Father, we reserve and share the testimony of your goodness, Lord, in the land of the living. Yes, Lord. And we thank you for those who are grieving. We thank you, Lord, that your word tells us that you comfort those who grieve. And so we want to live for persons who have lost loved ones during this period. And Lord, your name be glorified. They will find peace that surpasses all understanding because they would, have made, they would have made you their strength. So Lord, let us hear about your goodness, Father, in whatever way, shape, or form you desire to bring it to us. Lord, we thank you for our leadership, Lord God, the elders, Lord God, and those who you have put to lead us. We thank you that they are men and women who seek after you and seek after you with their hearts. Lord, we know that they will hear from you because you promised that if we seek you with our whole heart, then we'll hear from you. Thank you for the leadership that they have given us, Lord. We so are blessed, Lord, by them as they continue to teach the word, the word of truth, and lead us into the paths of righteousness so that our Lord's name may be known through us. Lord, we thank you for another Sunday where we can come and meet and pray and worship, Lord God, and break the word, Father. And as we fellowship with our families and friends online, Lord, you meet us there. We want to say you're an awesome Father and thank you very much for all that you have done, all you're doing, and all that you will do. In Jesus' name, amen.
victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord What the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good you turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good victory for the battle belongs to you lord i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you lord i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory for the Good morning. Today's scripture reading is taken from Hebrews 11 verses 1 to 6. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Warm greetings. Last week, we commenced our New Year teachings by concluding our reflections from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus gave instructions to build our lives on a solid foundation. Jesus taught that a person who listens to his words and obeys them builds on a rock-solid foundation and therefore will be able to weather the storms of life. On the other hand, the person who builds their life other than on Christ and his word builds on the sand and when the storms of life come, they will fall. Big application question out of last week's message would have been, on what are you building your life? On what are you building your life? 
Today, I wish to continue along the theme of building and living on a firm foundation by reflecting on what the Bible teaches is a vital ingredient to living an overcoming life. Jesus shared a parable with his disciples which highlights this very important fact. I want you to listen for it and turn in your Bibles to Luke 18, a parable told by Jesus, verses 1 through to 8. Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there is a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And this is what the Lord said. Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? And verse 8, very important, this is what Jesus said. I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth. The purpose of the parable is indicated in verse 1. We should always pray and not give up. You know, in Jewish society at the time, women were below men in social standing. A widow would therefore be in the unenviable position of not having a husband to promote and defend her rights. The unjust judge, however, who did not fear God or care about what people think, he gave justice to the oppressed widow. Big question why? She was persistent. She persevered in the face of enormous obstacles. We would say of the widow in Jamaica, what an audacity. You may ask, what is audacity? You know, it's, it's a willingness to take bold risk. It means to be daring, courageous, fearlessness, almost a kind of brazenness. Jesus' point in the parable is that God is not like the unjust judge. He's just and loving. Therefore, even more so, he will give justice quickly for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night. Those who are persistent, consistent, and, and daring. However, Jesus throws in a remarkable statement at the close of the parable. He says, when the Son of Man, that's the Messiah, Jesus, when he comes back, returns to the earth, Will he find faith on the earth? Faith in God, faith in Jesus is the vital factor needed to live an overcoming life. And I submit audacious faith. Hence the title of today's message, The Audacity of Faith. The Apostle John said, This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. That's 1 John 5 verse 4. Notice in Jesus' parable, there's a link between faith and prayer. Faithfulness, consistency, and perseverance in prayer to God is a mark of true faith. This is a solid way of assessing whether we are living lives of faith in God or alternatively relying on our own selves or looking to others, the world system, as foundation for our lives. Simple question, do you pray? Do I pray? How often do you pray? What do you pray about? A simple test of faith is our prayer life. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not give up. I want to speak further about faith by reflecting on Hebrews 11, which contains stories of heroes of faith. I want to put that chapter, chapter 11 of Hebrews, however, in its context. You know, the book of Hebrews is a letter written to first century Jewish Christians who had put their faith in God through Jesus Christ. Their faith, however, was threatened by false teachers who contended that salvation was not by faith in Christ alone, but by observance of the Jewish law. The writer deals with these false teachings by showing the superiority of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And from the outset of the letter, he reveals what I would call the credentials of Jesus Christ. He tells us that in the past, chapter 1 of Hebrews, he says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But 
in these last days, that's he, that's God, has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. This is how he describes the Son. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in high. That's Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. And the writer of Hebrews shows that Jesus is superior to the prophets. That's in chapter 1. And the angels in chapter 1. The great law giver Moses. Jesus is superior to him. He speaks of that in chapter 3. And as a result, he's superior to the law which was given by Moses. Jesus is superior to the high priest Aaron, out of whom the lineage of high priests find their heritage. Jesus is greater than every human high priest. In fact, the scripture teaches in chapter 4 of Hebrews that Jesus is the believer's great high priest who empathizes with our issues and struggles because he in his humanity experienced suffering and struggle but without sin. He's therefore able to provide mercy and grace to help us in our times of need. I want to pause to just say that again. That because of who Jesus is and what he has done for us, he's in a position to provide mercy and grace to help you in your times of need. We see those words in Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. The writer also shows the superiority of Jesus by comparing the ministry of Jesus with that of the earthly high priest who served in the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a tent, a place of worship for the Israelites as they wandered through the desert on the way to the promised land. It had an outer court, an inner court, and what was described as the Holy of Holies. To enter into the tabernacle, bloody animal sacrifices had to be made to cover over or atone for the sins of the worshippers. And these sacrifices only provided, however, temporary cover for sins, and they therefore had to be repeated year in and year out. The area known as the Holy of Holies was where God's very presence, the Shekinah, the glory, resided. And it could only be entered into by the high priest once a year on what was known as the Day of Atonement. The priest had to ensure that he offered sins, um, sacrifices sorry, for his own sin and for the sins of the people before he dared enter into this space called the Holy of Holies to carry on his ministry. And these requirements help us to appreciate the holiness of God and that our sins are a barrier between God and us. Jesus Christ was foreshadowed, prefigured in these dirty sacrifices offered for the forgiveness of sins. The, these animal sacrifices, they were to be without blemish. And when we look at the life of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he came to earth as a human being and he lived a blemish-free life sinless life. We deserve God's judgment and the sentence of death, which would have been eternal separation from God because of our sins. But Christ died in our place as our sin offering. Is there praise the Lord in your house? And I ask the question, why? Because God loves you and God loves me. His death, burial, and resurrection open the door for those who trust in him to enter now into the very presence of the living God. We no, no longer need to go through any earthly high priest. You know, when Jesus died on that cross, the barrier, the curtain separating the Holy of Holies from the worshipers in the temple, the scripture tells us it was torn from top to bottom at the death of Christ. And that signal an act of God is God who do it. And God making himself accessible for us to be reconciled to him is there, praise the Lord. And whereas the earthly priest would enter the earthly tabernacle repeatedly to offer the same sacrifices day in and day out unto God, Jesus' sacrifices was done once and for all and never to be repeated again. His sacrifice is therefore superior to all other sacrifices. In Hebrews 9, we read this, these words. So Christ was sacrificed once, once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, 
but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. And so then, in light of who Jesus is, in light of the superiority and excellence of his person and his love for us in bringing salvation to humankind, the writer to the Hebrews calls his readers. He speaks to us and he says, we need to live lives befitting what Christ has done for us. Simply put, not give up your faith. Not turn back, no backslide. Take your salvation and Jesus seriously and live a life of complete trust in him. And so the writer says in chapter 10, in verse 22, and he says, make, make we draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. 23 says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Verse 24 says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, encourage one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. That's Hebrews 10, 22 to 25. The writer continues by outlining the awful state we place ourselves in if we turn back from following Jesus Christ. It's like trampling under your foot the blood of Christ. It is the most gross and vile disrespect in the world to turn back from our faith, having regard to what Christ has done for us. And in the closing verses of Hebrews 10, the writer again makes the call to keep the faith. Verse 35 on, he says, don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. He says you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by what? Say it with me. By? By faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. Hebrews 10, 35 to 38. This is the context for Hebrews 11. It provides examples. Hebrews 11 now provides examples of those who have gone before us, who have kept the faith. The writer's intention in, in, in outlining these heroes of faith is to spur us on to walk in our, in our respective lives of faith in Christ. And in chapter 12, he gives a supreme example of a person who lived a life of faith. Who is that? Call his name, Jesus Christ. And he calls us to emulate those who have gone on before us. Now, we have been talking about faith, but we haven't defined it. What is faith? Well, the opening verse of Hebrews 11 tells us, it is being sure of what we hope for and certain of things we do not see. Now, this posture is contrary to how we are taught to live in the world. We are taught seeing is believing or true. The question then is, how can you be sure of what you hope for and certain of what we, we now see? I submit the answer to that question is not based on the amount or quantum of our faith you have or you can muster, but it's really about the who or whom in whom you put your faith. And that is why Jesus taught about mustard seed faith. He says, if you have faith as little as a mustard seed, which is a pinhead, you can actually move mountains. You know, my family, friends, work associates, for example, are quite sure of certain things they hope for from me, most of the times, I believe, because they know me and know that if I make a promise to them, I shall more often than not carry it out. They therefore repose faith in me that the things they hope for from me will materialize. Why? Because of my promise and my track record of keeping my word. I want to suggest this is the basis on which we generally have faith in people or even in things. It is based on a person's character and track record. And so I want to suggest then that having regard to the fact that Jesus is the son of the living God and in light of the record of his life and ministry on your behalf and mine, the writer says, put your faith in him. We can dare to trust God. We can dare to have an audacious, courageous, brazen faith, regardless of the circumstances and for what may seem impossible because of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. He has an impeccable track record. 
You know, the writer does not take a lot of time defining what faith is, but simply goes on to tell us stories of faith. And I want to suggest then that faith is therefore not so much about definitions, but it has to do with very practical, everyday living. Faith has a mental component, but essentially, faith is an action word. Look at verse 6 of our text. It says this, Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So if you, you'll notice then that true faith and obedience to God are inseparable. Brennan Manning, now deceased, wrote a book titled Ruthless Trust, A Ragamuffin's Path to God. And I've referenced him on a number of occasions in my messages. And I've used his definition for faith, which I've found compelling and I dare for use it again today. He defines faith as ruthless trust. Now, we may readily understand faith as trusting God, but why do you add ruthless to it? You know, the word ruthless means without pity. Well, Richard Foster, who wrote the foreword to Manning's book, explains why. And I, I want to quote what, what Foster says in the foreword to Brennan Manning's book. He says, by calling us to ruthless trust, Manning is really standing against all this self-pity that plagues modern culture. He's calling us to a trust that stoutly refuses to regard self-interest as the highest good in life. Let me say it again. He's calling us to a trust that stoutly refuses to regard self-interest as the highest good in life. This is, he continues, a frontal attack on all the egocentric, hyphenated self-sins of our day, and he lists some of them, self-indulgence. Self-will, self-aggrandizement, self-gratification, self-righteousness, self-sufficiency, and the like. I want to suggest today that the heroes of faith that are indicated in Hebrews 11 show this kind of ruthless, audacious faith in God. They were not concerned about protecting themselves, earthly security, or self-gratification. Their priority, when you look at their lives, was pleasing God regardless of circumstances, even to the point of death. Their faith was audacious. They lived in faith and died in faith. Look at verses 13 to 16 of Hebrews 11. It says this, all these people were still living by faith when they died. Notice this, they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, this is what, this is how it describes their perspective. They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. The things these heroes hoped for, we see in our text, they did not see or receive in their lifetime, but they trusted God nonetheless. They saw it from a distance. I want to suggest that that is ruthless trust. That's audacious faith. Their priority was not, therefore, on earthly possession or things, but their lives were anchored in the God of the universe. Can I ask you a question? Is that how we live our lives? You know, sadly but true, many of our lives are lived on the basis of pursuing and trusting in in money or other earthly things or people apart from God. I want to suggest that if we claim to be believers in Jesus and are not trusting God in this ruthless way, we are effectively dissing our great salvation. If we are refusing to follow Jesus, we are in fact, in fact singing from Hebrews because unbelief is defined as sin. Manning suggests that childlike surrender in trust is the defining spirit of authentic discipleship. Here are Jesus' words on this. He says, trust God, trust also in me. It sounds so simple. Trust God, trust also in me. That's what Jesus says. Let us examine a few example of, uh, examples of these heroes of faith. You know, he, Abraham is spoken of in verse 8 onwards in our text. 
he was told by God to, to pack up, pack your bags and go and leave his homeland. He, that, he didn't know where he was going, but he obeyed. And when Abram had long past childbearing age, he was told by God, I'm going to give you a son. Now, to compound the problem, his wife Sarah was also long past childbearing age and was, the scripture says, barren. He was as good as dead, but the scripture says, yet he believed God and God gave him a son. Verse 11 of Hebrews tells us, he considered him faithful who made the promise. His confidence, therefore, was not in his faith, but in the faithfulness of God. You see, faith focuses on God and his faithfulness, his character, his track record. Now, when their son Isaac was born, God told Abram to sacrifice this son of promise on an altar. <laughs> what kind of God is this? Is this a sick joke? You know, perhaps some of us would have said, get thee behind me, Satan. But Abram, based on his relationship with God, he knew this was God speaking to him and he proceeded to obey God's instructions. And we have an insight into Abram's thinking in our text, which is unusual because the rest of the scriptures doesn't tell us this. But in Hebrews, it tells us how he was thinking. It says, by faith, Abram, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Hear Abram's reasoning. Abram reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. I want to suggest that Abram's life demonstrates aud audacious faith, ruthless trust in operation. And God's dealings with Abram and indeed with all the heroes of faith tells us that our faith will, our faith will, not might, it will be tested. God tests us or allows us to be tested and experience trouble. How? Why? To shape us, to, to refine us, to purify our hearts, our minds, and our motives, our perspectives. He tests us so that we may have an opportunity, as it were, to discard the crutches we cling to for support and to trust him totally, uncompromisingly, ruthlessly, with audacity. Faith produces fortitude if we anchor in God. And so big question, will you trust God even in the face of death? Or if he asks you to give up whatsoever or whoever is your beloved Isaac. You know, Job said in the face of his predicament and crosses, though he slay me and he lost everything, you know, virtually everything. He says, though he slay me, yet will I trust, I will hope in him. That's Job 13 and verse 15. I therefore agree with Brennan Manning and submit that the supreme need in most of our lives is most often the overlooked, namely the need for an uncompromising trust in the love of God. You see, if we truly trust in the love of God, we would not fear. Perfect love casts out fear. We would not be anxious or insecure. We would not be arrogant and proud because the love of God would soften our spirits and humility would flood our souls. Arrogance is really a, def a defense mechanism, hiding insecurities. If we trusted God uncompromisingly in his love, we would not shrink back in following the Lord. Abram had this kind of uncompromising trust in the love of God. God, it, he reasoned, knew what he was, he was doing. If he took Isaac's life, God could surely raise him back from the dead. What a faith. You know, as I reflected on the life of Abraham, I noted that he was not perfect. He's not a perfect person. In fact, he told uh, huge fat lies on at least two occasions in order to save his own skin. And this tells me that God loves broken, fallen, dysfunctional people. It tells me that there's a place for every ragamuffin in the kingdom of God. The Oxford English Dictionary defines a ragamuffin as a, a person in dirty and ragged clothes. And I submit that in a, in a figurative sense, that is how each and every one of us is in the sight of God, outside of the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. We are dirty and in the filthy rags of sin. However, Jesus came to die for ragamuffins. Is there a praise the Lord? He came to die for liars like Abraham and tricksters like, like Jacob. 
Jacob, if you know your scriptures, told lies in order to rob his brother Esau of his birthright. He was a jinal, a bandul artist of no mean order. He, however, was transformed by the grace of God. And he's also listed among the heroes of faith. Consider also the prince of Egypt. What was his name? Moses. Whom the text says chose to leave the luxury of Egypt and not to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. The scripture says he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Look at verses 24 to 26. It tells us that. But did you know that Moses was also a murderer? But he was forgiven by God and served God faithfully. And as we look through the heroes of faith, we come across men and women who were frail just like we are and who failed God in so many ways. Think, for example, of, 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 of Rahab. Verse 31 tells us about her. She was a prostitute. She protected the spies who were on reconnaissance in Jericho. And she believed in the God of Israel and she was saved. And testimony to her value and worth in the eyes of the living God is evidence not only in her occupying a place among the heroes of faith, but she is in the very lineage of Jesus Christ. What kind of God is this? God specializes in ragamuffins who trust uncompromisingly in his love. And so I ask you, do you believe that God is good and really loves you? Do you trust his love even when you have no clue what God is doing? Let us consider that great leader and king of Israel. Bears my, I bear his name, David. A man, we are told, was after God's own heart. Yet the scriptures unblushingly tell us about his lust for, for women, with which many men can identify. He committed adultery and then murdered a man in order to get his wife and then lied about it. This ragamuffin, when confronted by, by Nathan the prophet about his sins, repented and he received God's forgiveness. He too had an uncompromising trust in the love of God. And God calls him a man after his own heart. What's my point in all of this? The faith life, the life of ruthless trust, audacious faith is for ordinary, broken, mashed down, sinful people like you and me. When we uncompromisingly trust in God's love, he radically transforms liars, adulterers, prostitutes, and sinners all into saints. I'm one of them. I'm a ragamuffin transformed by trust in God's love. And we can then join the heroes of faith and tell our own faith stories. Can I ask you a question? What sin have you committed? Or empty crutch are you holding on to which the devil is holding up in your face to prevent you from ruthlessly trusting in the love of God. Let it go. Trust God. The stories in our text are all so varied, but they all have underlying themes of broken people, ruthlessly trusting in the love of God, which is expressed in courageous obedience to him, regardless of the consequences. You know, in closing, I therefore want to reflect on the results of the faith of these heroes of faith. Verse 32 on in Hebrews 11's powerful section, it says, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about, and it mentions some people, Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lands, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword whose weakness was turned into strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured. Hmm. Look at the flip. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers, flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, 
yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. What a contrasting picture you would say of what we would call successful Christian living. What a contrast. Somebody enormous triumphs in the human arena and mighty victory. Others, however, seemed not to triumph on the human plane. In my own life, you know, I've, we, Brenda and I have known the loss of, uh, 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 you know, through miscarriage. You know, very first child was a miscarriage. And that was in the face of, of earnest prayer. And we had a faith challenge when Lauren was to be born. That's our first child. You know, Brenda um, suffered a ruptured appendicitis. I'm going to have to pray through that. And Lauren's name, in fact, means victory. It's a statement, a declaration of God's victory in that situation. Many of us know the loss of loved ones over the period of this pandemic. Not only from COVID, but from other circumstances. It has been a difficult time. Many from among us have lived and died in faith. There have been testimonies of healing. There have also been what I would call faith funerals. Can I tell you a quick story? It's a true story of Horatio Gates Spafford, who was born in New York in 1828. He lived in Chicago. He was well known for his Christian witness. He and his wife, Anna, they were blessed with five children. He had considerable wealth. He was a lawyer and he owned a great deal of property. But tragedy came to him in great measure to this very happy home. When four years old, their son, Horatia Jr., died suddenly of scarlet fever. Then only a year later, in October 1871, a massive fire swept through downtown Chicago, devastating the city, including many properties owned by Horatia. Many persons died and were homeless. But despite their own substantial financial loss, the Spaffords sought to demonstrate the love of Christ by assisting those who were grief-stricken and in great need. Two years later, in 1873, Spafford decided his family should take a holiday in England after all of these crosses. Horatia didn't make the trip because of business, so he sent his family ahead, his wife and their four remaining children. He had four daughters remaining, aged 11, 9, 5, and 2. Their ship was struck by an iron sailing ship, and all four of Horatia Spafford's daughters died. But remarkably, Anna, his wife, survived. Anna, when she was able, she sent a telegram to her husband, which included the words, saved alone. When he received their message, he sent, you know, he set off at once to be reunited with his wife. And one particular day during the, the voyage, the captain summoned him to the bridge of the vessel. And pointing to his charts, he explained that they were then passing over the very spot where the vessel on which his wife and children traveled had sunk and where his daughters had died. And it is said that Spafford returned to his cabin and wrote the words of this great hymn. He wrote these words, when peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And he wrote several other verses, one of which I'd want to share with you. He said this, Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. If you know this chorus, sing with me. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. 
We need to understand what overcoming successful Christian living may look like from God's eyes. It's illustrated in the annals of the heroes of faith. You know, there is a false faith that equates material wealth with true spirituality. A false faith that promotes self-centered living. A false faith that says we know all the answers. A false faith that treats God like a, how would I put it, like a glorified vending machine who must meet all our needs upon our demands so long as you get the prayer formula right. Hear me and hear me well. God heals and delivers in this life. However, if he chooses not to do so, authentic, audacious faith trusts him regardless. It's the attitude of the three Hebrew boys who are thrown into the fiery furnace. And they hear their words that says, if we perish, we're going to perish. But we now bow to idols, even if God does not rescue us. You see, there's a saving faith. There's, a, there's an overcoming faith. And there's an enduring faith. God not removing suffering, but taking us through suffering. In any event, we audaciously affirm the love and power of God through worship and obedience. True faith then is ruthless trust. This is ragamuffins yielding to the almighty God and allowing him to transform us. Some of us were, you know, some of us thought the truth, Gallus, Jezebel, bad word cussing merch, and stog, some were goody two shoes, but all still sinners, converted by Jesus into saints, committed followers of Jesus, who are now committed to wives or husbands, children, family, church, and society in wholesome ways. Many of us could tell our own stories. Ragamuffins, transformed by ruthless trust, audacious faith in the love of God. True faith is a practical, audacious trust in our loving God under whatever pressure or circumstance. Sometimes the path ahead is unclear and paved with obstacles and trials. God does not require us to be clear about everything, but he'll give us light for the next step. But he always calls us to trust him. God has demonstrated his love for us. He has revealed that he is totally trustworthy. And God rewards our faith in this life and provides unimaginable rewards in the life to come. Eyes have not seen nor ears heard what God has in store for those who love him. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. And so the big question today is, to you and me, is will we uncompromisingly trust God's love? Will we ruthlessly trust the living God? Or will we shrink back and live our lives trusting on our vain crutches, which can never sustain us in this life, nor in the life to come? What is preventing you from giving your life over to this loving God without reservation? What problem are you facing today which God cannot deal, him, deal with. I want to say to you today, trust him today. In Jesus, you see, our hope is certain. Our peace is secure. Our joy is full. And as we face 2020 and the uncertainties ahead, the life of audacious faith, ruthless trust in a loving God is therefore not an alternative way of life among others from which we can choose. I want to suggest today, it is only when we live lives of faith that we truly begin to live. Let us therefore live with audacious faith in King Jesus, in his name. Amen and amen. Can we make some applications from our message today, even as we come to pray? Applications that I'm also making to my own lives. Can, can I ask you, as I ask myself, am I walking, living in obedience to God and his word? How is your, my prayer life? You know, sometimes it's so difficult to get into that closet and pray alone. We can be, reach out to others, join us in our prayer meetings and join in with others that can, it, that can spur us on to pray. Is my life marked by persistence, consistency, faithfulness in prayer? Are there unconfessed sins for which I need to repent? And I want to ask you this now. Have you lost faith in God because of some unanswered prayer or disappointment? I want to ask you to bring your 
cussing before God and how you feel exactly before God. And brothers and sisters, I want to encourage us to encourage, support, care for each other. And as the scripture says, provoke one another to love and good works. Pray for one another. Strength the feeble hands and weak knees. Jesus empathizes with you and me. He prays for us. Can you imagine that? He intercedes for you and me. We can bring our concern for him. We can pray for wisdom, courage, healing, and deliverance. We can ask him to comfort us when we grieve. We can ask him to reveal his specific plans for your life, for your family, for if you're in school, your role in school, the workplace, your role in the church and nation. Believe him to work in us, in you, and through you and others to accomplish his good purposes in God's way and in God's time. Let's pray. Take a moment to reflect and then I just leave us in prayer. Lord, your character and track record prove that you are good, pure in heart and loving. Please forgive us even this day, Lord, for behaving as if that is not true and relying on ourselves and others instead of you. Forgive us, forgive me, Lord, for my prayerlessness. Help us to express prayer as surrender to your will and not as an attempt to manipulate you into doing our will. I ask you today, Lord, by, by, the great, by your grace, to empower us by your spirit to persevere in prayer and not to give up. Please cause, Lord, that 2022 will be the year of audacious faith for us, the people of God. Help us this year to believe, love, and obey you more and more. Lead each and every one of us, Lord, into the specific 2022 plan you have for our lives that we can faithfully represent you wherever you place us. And today, Lord, we, 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 we renounce everything that stands in the way of pleasing you this year. We trust you to heal and provide for us in your love and power. By faith, we choose to do things your way. In Jesus' name. There may be those who are listening to our service today. You don't even know this Jesus to whom I was just praying. I'm praying through to God. And you need to receive him today as your personal Lord and Savior. I want to encourage you to open your heart to Jesus. You can simply pray to him, Lord, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I choose today to put my faith, my confidence, my trust in you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me your child. Fill me with your blessed Holy Spirit to live for you a life of faith from this day forward. If you have reached out to the Lord today to receive the Lord, at the close we have some numbers. We ask you to give us a call. We'd like to help you on your spiritual journey. And believe us, please feel free to call as well those numbers that are indicated on the screen or call us at the office, we want to help you on your journey. If you are going through struggle and difficulty, we are here to support one another as together we live lives of faith. Right now, we're going to be ministered to again in song, song of worship, after which I will do our benediction. Spirit sound rushing wind fire of God fall within Holy Ghost breathe on us we pray as we repent turn from sin revival embers smoldering breath of God fan us into Cause we need a fresh wind The fragrance of heaven Pour your spirit out Pour your spirit out
spirit out Cause we need a fresh wind fresh we need a fresh wind oh. For hearts that burn with holy fear Purified in faith and deed Refiner's fire Strengthen what remains So we the church Who bear your light Lamp of flame City bright King and kingdom Come is what we pray Cause we need a fresh wind The fragrance of heaven Pour your spirit Let us now share our benediction. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen and Amen. God bless you. A blessed new year to you and yours. To receive personal confidential prayer, call, email, or text. WhatsApp or call us today up to 11.30 a.m. at 876-521-9437 or 876-877-9794. And for mail callers only, please reach out at 876-371-0898 or email your request to prayer at swallowfieldchapel.org or by text at 876-395-7694. Visiting with us for the first time? Welcome! We invite you to complete the contact card in the link below to connect with us. God bless you. Thank you for giving in these troubled times. 
We invite you to continue to give as the Lord enables you to support our ministries and those in special need. Here are a few convenient ways to do so. You may deposit your tithes and offerings in the drop box at the church office at number 7, Mondays to Fridays from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Tithes and offerings can also be done by direct online deposit to our Swallowfield Chapel BNS New Kingston current account, account number 804161, branch number 50575. Or you can log on to swallowfieldchapel.org and click Give to make your direct online contribution. Financial contributions for food care packages should be so indicated. Young Adults, Meet Up resumes this Monday, January 10, 2022 at 8 p.m. via IG Live. Follow and share at Let's Meet Up JA on Instagram. Discipling Others, are you interested in facilitating a small group? Apply today by clicking the link in the description below and someone will contact you to help you get started on this great opportunity to disciple others. Training will be provided. Sunday school classes resume next week Sunday, January 16, 2022 at 8 a.m. See you soon. Don't miss Believers Meeting this Thursday at 6 p.m. And remember, all are welcome to join us every weekday morning and on Saturdays for our online prayer meeting from 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. Click and share the link in the description below. For the links to these and other activities, visit our website, swallowfieldchapel.org forward slash announcements. And here's a reminder to stay safe. Wear your mask, wash hands regularly, sanitize, and maintain physical distance. May God bless you and keep you always.